God to David promising that he would never fail to have a man to sit upon the throne, that God would not desert him. He would punish him in his sin, but his love would never be removed from him. Let's sing number 172, the first three stanzas. Our text is verse 13 of 2 Samuel 12. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, rarely do we see in all of Scripture such a portrayal of sin in all its hideousness as what we see in David in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Nowhere are we shown more clearly the fearful power and horrible work of sin upon our depraved nature than here, than in this man, who though he was so specially favored, 
and highly honored of God and called the man after God's own heart sunk so shamefully low as to commit adultery and murder. Yet nowhere also do we see more vividly the amazing grace of God revealed toward such a sinner who pursues us with a grace that is far greater than all our sin. For almost a year, David remained impenitent. But then, as we read in verse 1, the Lord sent Nathan to David. Oh, what great and genuine comfort every servant of Christ should find in these first six words of this chapter. For they signify that apart from the persevering grace of God, all would be lost and all would be bleak and hopeless. Not only for David, but for each one of us. For what if God's grace did not pursue us? What if the Lord were to abandon us in our sin as we deserve whenever we fell into it? No, we may not succeed as David did. And by succeed, I mean outwardly commit what David did or any other lustful, hateful, or covetous act that we may entertain in our hearts and often do entertain in our hearts. But how many of us could honestly confess regarding the carrying out of many sinful desires that I would have if I could have. David didn't send for Nathan, but never did he more sorely need his counsel than now. No, it's God who took the initiative, as he always does. For we never seek him until he seeks us. So it was with Moses, resigned to live the quiet, easy life, tending the sheep at Midian after he had supposedly failed in Egypt to deliver his people. So we saw with despondent Elijah, ready to die under the broom tree after the Reformation in Israel seemed so short-lived. So we see with Jonah, running away from his assignment in Nineveh. And so we see with Peter, after he denied his Lord. It's the Lord who seeks them out and finds them. And it is this way, because as 2 Timothy 2 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And so we see here with sinful David. For as the Lord had promised in 2 Samuel 17, verse 14, when he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. <clears throat> but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul. God may allow his chosen ones to indulge the lust of the flesh, and fall into grievous sin. But he won't allow them to be content and continue in them. Rather, he makes them miserable to learn, as Proverbs 13, 15 says, that the way of the unfaithful is hard. And that, as Proverbs 22, verse 8 says, he who sows wickedness reaps trouble. No, a true child of God cannot long enjoy the pleasures of sin. As someone has said, nobody buys a little passing pleasure in evil at so dear a price or for so short a time as a believer. Yes, you may succeed in unfaithfulness for a while, 
But if you're a believer, the Lord will come after you. The fact is, the Lord was pursuing David even before he sent the prophet Nathan. For though the inspired historian of 2 Samuel reveals little about the wretchedness of David's soul following his terrible fall, such is revealed to us in the Psalms, penned by David after his heartfelt conviction and repentance. In Psalm 32, which we just read, David says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Why? Because though his heart and conscience accused him, still he would not own and speak to God about his sin. Therefore, groans of remorse were wrung from his yet unbroken heart. Self-disgust filled him while a sense of God's holy disfavor oppressed him and hounded him day after day. You know, even a palace can give no relief, no comfort to one so filled with bitter remorse. As king, he could command his subjects to be still, but he could not quiet the voice of his outraged conscience. Night and day he found no relief for his anxious and tormented soul. For as he goes on to say in Psalm 32, Day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. So it is for anyone who tries to hide their sin. For as Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who conceals his sins shall not prosper. With David, it was as if he were in a hot oven. All the joy of life was dried up for him. Most certainly, he suffered acutely in both body and soul. For as he says in Psalm 38, my back is filled with searing pain. Thus he dragged himself through that weary year. Ashamed of his guilty acts, miserable in his self-condemnation, afraid of God and lurking in the recesses of his palace away from the sight of the people. David learned thereby that every sin is a blunder and that we neither get the satisfaction we expect from them, or even if we do, for a moment, we get something along with it that more than spoils it all. For as Alexander McLaren has rightly said, it's a bitterness that stays in your mouth long after the intoxicating drink of temptation has been downed. So long as David refused to humble himself beneath the mighty hand of God and confess his sin, there could be no peace for him, no more communion with God, no blessing and no further growth in grace. Brothers and sisters, only God knows how many of his covenant people right within Christ's church are at this very moment under his chastening rod and are empty in their souls and joyless in their hearts for this very reason. Because of hidden and unrepentant sin. How important then the practice of keeping short accounts with both God and our neighbors to be reconciled with those we have offended today and to make it a point each night of laying before the Lord the sins of the day and desiring with all of our hearts to be cleared and cleansed of our wrongdoing. For any unrepentant sin only corrupts our sinful nature more and renders our hearts harder still until we cannot repent and it drags us down to destruction. Destruction. 
Apart from God's grace, we can't and won't do this. And so we read that the Lord sent Nathan to David. We might have thought, and this could have been the way, otherwise, that we might have thought, 2 Samuel 12 would have proceeded, that the Lord would send enemies to invade David or some other kind of terror or death to take hold of him as he deserved. But no. God sends him a prophet to restore him. Once again, we can only marvel, can't we, at how tenderly the Lord watches over his sheep at how faithfully he pursues and finds those who have strayed, and with what amazing goodness he heals their backslidings and continues to love them so freely. The prophet's task, however, was far from enviable. Can you imagine to confront this guilty king alone and face to face, for as yet, David had shown no evidence of repentance, no desire, no evidence they even desired repentance. As Arthur Pink says, God had not cast off his erring child, but he would not condone his grievous offenses. All must come out and into the light. The divine displeasure must be made evident. The culprit must be charged and rebuked. David must charge himself and then discover that where sin had abounded, grace abounded all the more. What a wondrous uniting of divine righteousness and mercy a righteousness and a mercy that we know was only possible because of the cross of Christ to come. For God's righteousness demanded that David be dealt with justly. But his mercy moved him to send Nathan that David be restored. Well might Nathan have trembled before the commission that God now gave him to go and to rebuke his royal master. Oh, if only every elder and minister of the word tempted to tone down the message and speak to us pleasant things. We're as faithful as he. Thus Nathan comes to David and by the wisdom God gives him causes David to condemn himself before and without him even knowing it. Nathan tells him a story that depicts the vileness of David's conduct and in such a way that he's made to confirm the gross injustice of which he himself was guilty. And he's made to see the excuselessness, the heartlessness, cruelty, and abominable selfishness of what he's done. Without doubt, David understood this story as a complaint being brought against one of his subjects. He believed, when Nathan was telling him, that it was an actual case. And of course it was. His case, though it was veiled in the form of a parable. Here Nathan tells David of a rich man and a poor man who lived in the same town. The rich man had everything, including a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little female lamb, which meant everything to him. 
To him, that lamb was like a treasured daughter, which he nurtured, and to which he gave food and drink from his own cup. This precious lamb even slept in his arms, so loved and cherished she was. But now a traveler comes to the rich man, and the rich man wants to serve him lunch. But what does he do? Instead of taking an animal from one of his many flocks and herds, he takes the little ewe that belonged to the poor man, and he butchers it for the traveler who had come to him. At this, David explodes with anger. Forgetful of his own crimes and filled with indignation, he goes so far as to even utter an oath, saying, as surely as the Lord lives. And then he pronounces judgment. The man who did this deserves to die. Then he declares the righteous restitution that must follow. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Literally, David says, surely a son of death is the man who did this. It's then that Nathan points his finger at David and says, you are the man. You are this very son of death. You are the man who deserves to die. What grace here, as God makes clear to David what David would never have acknowledged himself. And so it is often with you and I. You and I who can be so indignant against the sins we see in others, especially, of course, when they're committed against us, while we can remain so blind and so oblivious to our own sins. Only God's grace can make us see ourselves for what we are. Only the Spirit of God can pierce a calloused conscience and break a sin-hardened heart, something which he must do, does do, and continues to do in the hearts of his elect. Listen, if Lord's Day after Lord's Day you can hear the ten words of the covenant. If week after week you can hear Christ's summary of the law, if Sunday after Sunday you can hear that Christ came into the world to save sinners, but never hear this as applying to you, that you are the sinner in need of repentance and pardon, if in your heart you never hear the Spirit of God say, you are the man, you are the woman, you are the one who needs to own your sin and repent, then it's only because you are as yet a stranger to the grace of God. Through Nathan, God continued to convict David of his sin by reminding him of all his goodness and generosity towards him, delivering him from the hand of Saul, giving him far more than he needed and should have ever wanted, and ready to bestow even more upon him as well. And thus, in view of the utter senselessness of what David did, God says, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes. Already here, it should have been clear to David that he was, in fact, the rich man in Nathan's story. That Uriah was the man with the one ewe lamb, Bathsheba, who David took to himself. And that the traveler who came to the rich man 
was nothing other than David's own unchecked lust. Which rather than deny and put to death, he welcomed and entertained as a guest. Thus God made it clear to him that he himself was that son of death, the one who deserved to die. But the Lord wasn't finished with David yet. For as David pronounced temporal, punitive consequences upon the rich man's crime, so the Lord pronounced the consequences that will follow David's. Why? Because divine holiness will be vindicated. Because God's righteousness must be manifested. Because wrongdoers must be warned and God's children disciplined. And because David, together with us, must learn that a man reaps what he sows. God will ultimately deal with the unbelievers. That's why we don't often see justice come to them in this world. But with his own children, it's something totally different. David would soon find out how bad was the seed he had sown. Because David brought the sword against Uriah, God said, the sword will never depart from your house. And because David took Uriah's wife to be his own, God said, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. As you know, that turned out to be his own son, Absalom, whose immorality will be as public as yours were private and secret. Thus, as God said, out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. These horrible words are going to be horribly fulfilled in the next eight chapters to come. And yet we must see the grace of God here as well. Grace which convicted David of the dire seriousness of his sin and the awful fury of God against it and a grace which filled his heart with godly fear, moving him to abandon his sin and to cast himself upon the mercy of the Lord. You know, contrary to what some people think, grace does not always appear as niceness because grace isn't niceness and it doesn't always seem as god's undeserved favor even though it is for as the famous hymn amazing grace says "Twas grace that taught my heart to fear as john newton a former slave trader he had to be brought to that point of self-loathing as well as fear as to what his sins actually deserve. Well, that's by God's grace. With this, God's piercing arrow shot by Nathan found its target in the heart of David. And by his response, David showed that he was not a lost soul after all. That he was not abandoned by God. For then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Like the publican, David's words are few. But as we also read in Psalm 51, penned by David right after this, they were genuine, for they were filled with a godly sorrow for his sin and a wholehearted desire to be reconciled with the one that he had so grievously offended. 
dark as his crimes were against Uriah and Bathsheba, and also Joab, of course, he recognized that the true and awful character of his sin lie in the fact that it was committed against the almighty majesty of God. This is why he says, against you, you only have I sinned. He means you principally have I sinned. So every true penitent mourns his sin. Not because they got caught or because of its consequences, but because it has so displeased our holy God and dishonored our Heavenly Father. In Psalm 51, David cries out for cleansing as a filthy leper longing for wholeness and health. Here he longs to be cleansed of his iniquity and given a pure heart and a new spirit that desires to do God's will. He prays for this because he knows that such renewal was beyond himself and something only that God could give. And so he prays, do not cast me from your presence or remember, as he did with Saul, take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation. And what was God's reply? It's the same reply he gives to you and I in Jesus Christ. It's hardly conceivable. But as he says through Nathan, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. That's equal to hearing. The Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to be cast away into hell. Brothers and sisters, I wonder for all of our easy talk about confessing our sins and being forgiven, we haven't lost the marvel of what forgiveness is all about. That what David received, forgiveness, Restored communion with God and eternal life instead of condemnation is because of God's grace to us in Christ what we receive. So often we have nothing more than a a vending machine view of forgiveness rather than a miracle view. Like inserting our quick little prayer of confession And out comes our assurance of pardon. And often, it makes little or no difference in our lives. We may confess that we are of ourselves miserable sinners. And that forgiveness is wonderful and only possible because of the unfathomable and infinite suffering of Jesus on the cross as payment for our wrongs. But how rarely does the reality of it all strike our minds and convulse our emotions? How rarely do we respond as the Scottish reformer, the Marquis of Argyll, is recorded on the night before his execution, claimed that God was just now saying to me, he said, son, be of good cheer, Your sins are forgiven you. And upon repeating those words to a visitor, burst into tears and then walked over to a window to weep there. It was a man dying for the cause of Christ, recognizing how serious nonetheless his sins were. And to be reminded on the basis of what God's word said that his sins are actually forgiven was beyond him to comprehend. Instead, we've lost the thrill that ought to fill our souls and drive us to tears and make us shudder with joy that such forgiveness is even possible. 
that God is the God who, as Micah 7, verse 18 says, and here, listen to the, the words of the prophet who is likewise overwhelmed. The God who pardons sin, he says, and forgives transgression. Who, O oh God, is like you? What hope there is then, not only for the relatively righteous people out there, like, like us, I guess, most of us maybe, but even the greatest backslider, which of course any one of us could, apart from God's grace, become, if he or she will but humble themselves before the God of all grace. For as we see with David, God will never cast off the penitent believer, whatever his crimes have been, nor allow Satan to pluck any of his sheep out of his hand. Yes, there are consequences to our sins, as we see here as well. A holy God will discipline his holy people. David's son by Bathsheba died despite all his prayers. And the threatened calamity came, breaking David's poor heart again and again. And yet God gave him a son whom he loved, whom God loved, named Jedidiah or Solomon. And God gave David many more victories over his foes. In fact, he crowns him, we read in our passage, with a crown of the king of Rabbah. What a picture here. A sinner like David. And he's crowned. Well, it's a foreshadowing of you and I too, who unworthy sinners though we are because of Christ, will be crowned with his righteousness. Truly, as David acknowledged in Psalm 103, the Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Yes, our sins bring us bitterness. Make no mistake about that. But no matter how much we may find ourselves suffering, the earthly consequences of our sins such consequences are far, far from being as great as our sins. For the Lord has not treated us, Psalm 103 says, as our sins deserve, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Why not? How can it be possible for a just and holy God to do that, it's only possible because he has dealt with another as our sins deserve and enacted from him the full and just payment for our sins. And what God has demanded from our bleeding Savior, he will never demand from us. For God rewarded Christ according to our iniquities that he might reward us according to Christ's merits. For on the cross of Calvary, the unthinkable happened. The Son of God became none other than a son of death for us so that we might forever be the sons of God. God be praised for such a gospel revealed here in 2 Samuel 12. A gospel which though a stumbling block to the self-righteous, foolishness to the godless, furnishes everlasting comfort and joy 
for the hopeless but believing sinner. For those who come to know the blessing that David celebrates in Psalm 32. The blessing upon him or her whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are wholly covered. The blessedness of him whose sin the Lord will never count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. Yes, how blessed they are. Immeasurably blessed indeed. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you for this display, not only of warning, but again, of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the true son of David, who went to the cross, bearing not his own sin, but a sin that was our sin, that he willingly made his own and suffered, that we might be crowned with his perfect righteousness, eternal life, and everlasting blessing. Father, help us to see our own sins. Help us to see how unworthy we are Help us to see the sins of others against us in that light, the true light. Help us never to forget the death row from which we have been set free and the glorious message we have now to proclaim with our words and with our attitudes towards others, towards other sinners like ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond by...